Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. It has been a year since the Federal Reserve ended its policy of quantitative easing. This is where the Federal Reserve bought up over $4 trillion in financial assets of the big banks following the onset of the Great Recession. What do we know about the effects of this policy and the impact it has had on us in the U.S.? Joining me now to discuss all of this is Professor Jerry Epstein. He is the co-director of Perry at UMass Amherst. Jerry has just authored a paper with Juan Antonio Montesino titled, Did Quantitative Easing Increase Income Inequality? Let's talk about it. Jerry, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Charmini. So Jerry, did quantitative easing increase income inequality? Uh, yes, it probably did, uh, but not probably by quite as much as some of the strongest critics have, have suggested. You know, there's a big f debate now among economists and uh, politicians and others uh, about the effects of quantitative easing. And it, even though it ended over a year ago, as you said, um, it's still a big uh, debate because the Federal Reserve is still, as you know, continuing to keep interest rates down at zero. And so some of the same arguments and debates about quantitative easing apply uh, to the issue of uh, what is the impact of the zero interest rate policy and when, and uh, if and when the Federal Reserve should start raising interest rates again. Right. And, uh, and why does the uh, Federal Reserve do this, implement such policy? Well, as you said, it, it related to the great financial crisis, the financial meltdown that occurred in 2008. The Federal Reserve, acting as the lender of last resort, came in and uh, wanted to try to bail out the, uh, the banks, partly in the hope of bailing out the banks, partly in the hope of keeping a floor under the, cra the crashing U.S. economy and global in economy. So by the end of uh, 2008, the interest rate was down to zero, pretty much, uh, with the Federal Reserve had lowered interest rates so much. But they, they realized they still needed to do more. So they figured out, well, what can we do? Ben Bernanke, the chair, had been thinking about this for quite a while because uh, Japan had been in a similar situation about a decade before. And he and his, some of his colleagues, uh, along with the, some uh, people at the Bank of England, devised what they called quantitative easing, which is really just a fancy word for the Federal Reserve printing money, buying uh, various kinds of financial assets with the hope that the financial asset values would go up. Uh, this would help the banks get some bad assets off of their books. But it would also, they hope, lower uh, interest rates, increase liquidity, so that there would be real investment in the economy, generating more employment and more output. But uh, it didn't quite work out that way. So uh, you mentioned earlier that it had a modestly disequalizing uh, effect despite of having um, equalizing changes to, say, employment or mortgage financing. Um, explain that a little bit more, um, right. the different effects it has had. So uh, the debate is, uh, some people say, look, the, the Federal Reserve, as I, I just said, they buy up all these financial assets, and that increases the value of these assets. And who owns the assets? Well. It's well known that it's primarily the 1% and the 0.01% of the income and wealth distribution that own most of the financial wealth. So uh, by definition, when you, uh, the Federal Reserve is doing something, printing money to buy financial assets, driving up their prices, that's going to immediately uh, help the, the, the rich and the banks that own these assets first. And in fact, that's what we found out by looking at these data. However, as Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen and other economists uh, have argued, that's not the only effect. Um, there are, in fact, many, various channels through which this quantitative easing can affect people in the economy. As you said, it can also uh, lower interest rates, generate more investment and employment. Another thing it can do is uh, lower refund, uh, fin refinancing costs for for uh, people who have home mortgages or student loans. Um, that can help uh, people in debt, which are typically people in the middle or lower end of the income distribution. Um, but on the other side, it can also lower interest rates for savers, uh, people who have money in the checking 
and savings account, which tend to be more middle class people, so their returns on those kinds of investments go down. So uh, the, the, the real thing that's difficult and that we tried to do was to how do you balance off all of these impacts? How do you estimate these countervailing impacts? So what we found was that uh, overall, equity prices went up significantly and did help the wealthy significantly. Um, and uh, there was some decline in financing costs, but that didn't really help the poorest and the people who were in the most trouble because they were completely blocked out of refinancing. They were completely blocked out of credit, so they weren't helped at all. The one positive thing, and uh, lowering interest rates on savers, uh, hurt middle class and uh, poorer people. The one thing that the quantitative easing did do is it uh, helped to generate some employment and um, for, for, for workers and people in the middle and the lower end of the income distribution. The problem is, wages, actually, real wages, actually fell over this period. Not only were they stagnant, they actually declined. So overall, the benefit for most people uh, was pretty modest because of the, of the terrible state of uh, labor markets, the unions, and, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so overall, it uh, did increase inequality. But there's this paradox, which, um, uh, which we point out. Namely, for most of the post-war period, and in fact, for most of the last couple hundred years, when Progressive talked about the, uh, the evils of central bank uh, monetary policy or certain kinds of monetary arrangements, the, the typical criticism is that interest rates are too high. You know, if interest rates are too high, uh, yeah, that helps the banks, but it uh, harms debtors, and it makes it harder to generate employment. In this debate, progressives are saying, well, uh, the problem is that interest rates were too low. That's what helped uh, the banks and hurt workers and the debtors. Mm -hmm. And what the question we ask is, well, you, can you have it both ways? And uh, what we um, are arguing is that, unfortunately, in our current situation, uh, whether the central bank raises interest rates or whether it lowers interest rates, it's either going to hurt or not help uh, workers and poor people very much, because the central problem is that um, the, the uh, unions are so weak, the government has done as much as it can to smash unions, globalization has undermined the bargaining power of workers, and this, the government has not done enough to really try to change the structure of the financial system so that the, the poorest people and uh, uh, others can actually get access to credit. So in the end, monetary policy by itself, uh, without better fiscal policy, restructuring uh, banks and so forth, um, isn't going to help workers much either way. And Jerry, this is exactly the policy that they are uh, implementing in Europe, faced with similar situations as we were faced with in 2007-8. Uh, That's right. And there, um, probably the results are going to be very similar, because given the uh, strictures, uh, the straitjacket of austerity, and uh, the top role of the euro, and is what you've been reporting on, um, the way that they're treating debtor countries like Greece, uh, this quantitative easing is only going to probably uh, help the wealthiest and the banks. Right. Jerry, I appreciate it. Every time you do reports like this and you analyze the impact it has had on us, or not had on us in this case, thank you so much. Thanks, Charmaine. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.